Beautiful. Okay. Okay. Perfect. So it's four o'clock. Right. Ready to begin. Yeah, Thank yeah. you, Rabbi Minkowitz and Rabbi Gurkov, for agreeing to this. Um, for those watching, Rabbi Minkowitz and Rabbi Gurkov are both very good friends of Rabbi Yitzi, dating back a long, long time ago. Um, Rabbi Minkowitz, I believe you were his classmate from for how long? From uh, kindergarten through elementary school, basically. Most of elementary school. Wow. So, plus, we also have neighbors. Uh, we live, we grew up three houses down from each other. And both our parents, Baruch Hashem, uh, still live in the same houses. So the uh, every time we go back to New York, it's the same, reliving the same experience. So, Amen. 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 Right. Amen. And Rabbi Gurkov, where do you know Rabbi Yitzi from? How many we, years? We kind of knew each other growing up in Crown Heights, but we really got, became friends when we were on Shlichus in New Haven. It's quite remarkable because we really only got to know each other in tough shin and gimel but we became such tight friends All right and i know Rabbi Yitzhi's asked you to for bring in the past that says that says something about you um so without further ado let's begin i think we should start with reading the article um it is on the it's on the website torahformyeyes.com um Rabbi Minkowitz, you have it open I do. Yeah, should I read it? Oh, did, read the article? Yeah, please. Oh, actually, I had it a minute ago, but then I uh, moved over to the YouTube page. Hold on one second, Torah from my eyes. Okay. Anyone who's on the live stream, you can go to TorahFromMyEyes.com and follow along. Correct. <clears throat> okay. So first of all, before I start reading again, it's a special, special privilege and honor to be invited to be on this stream in uh, sharing thoughts about Yitzhi's Divertera. Uh, Yitzi, as we all know, is an incredible inspiration to not only to us, but Jews all over the world and even non-Jews. I hear about it all the time from people. And the fact that he puts out these words of Torah, the fact that he puts out these words of Torah is just incredible. And to be invited here to, to spend this little fabringen together talking about this most recent article for Sukkot is very, very special. So thank you. And I want to give Yitzhi a bracha that he should have uh, a yom v'shalom toivus. Hashem should give him the strength and the ability to continue inspiring Jews all over the world and to be able to continue to do what he's doing. And in a, in a miraculous way, uh, we believe in miracles. Hashem should give him a four uh, shleimah kreva that his, he should, his quality of life should go to 100% and he should be able to, to be able to continue inspiring the whole world. And also want to take a moment to give a bracha to his Rebetzin, who is the absolute um, real miracle in this whole story of keeping not only Yitzi's life together, but the whole family and her, her own life. Shem should give her strength in honor of the Amun in honor of the Torah learning that we're going to do in the next hour to continue doing what she does for Yitzi, for her family, and for Klal Yisrael. Amen. And Eichet Gezun Amen. Exactly. And they should have lots of Simcha and Nachas from the kids, from the grandchildren, and all the future ones to come as well. So Yitzhi wrote an article about Sukkot. Essentially, it's based on the famous Medrash. We'll read it. <clears throat> then he added, of course, his own flavor. And uh, I'll read it to you now, and then we'll talk about it. What is the value of another Jew? Sukkot is a time of unity, camaraderie, and brotherly love. We sit together in the Sukkah. We dance together every night at Simcha's Beis HaShieva. And with the Torah on Simchas Torah, we eat delicious food and we sing songs. We, of course, daven together and bring together the Arba Minim, the four kinds, the Lulav, the Esrik, the Hadassim, and the Aravas. The taking together of the Arba Minim is a biblical commandment. It says, and you should take for yourself a beautiful fruit of the tree, which is the Esrik, a date palm, which is the, a date palm, which is the Lulav, a sprig from a bush, that looks braided, which is the Hadassim, and Willows of the Brook, which, which are the Aravis. Our sages have attributed symbolism to this mitzvah, specifically with regards to the unity of the Jewish people. Torah knowledge is the flavor of Judaism, and doing mitzvahs is the fragrance. As far as fragrance and flavor is concerned, there are four kinds of Jews. First, there is the Lulav, an unopened date palm frond, leaves united together, straight and tall, the dates that grow on the date palm are flavorful, but do not have a distinct smell. This is the one we say, the blessing of Antithel Levan. 
It symbolizes our Torah scholars whose main occupation is studying Torah. The flavor of Judaism, just as dates have flavor. True, they too do many mitzvahs, but their main involvement is in Torah study and are recognized for that. Tall beacons of light we look to for guidance and leadership. The esrig, a citron, pretty, fragrant, and flavorful. The esrig stays on the tree year-round, uniting the seasons. This symbolizes the very well-rounded Jew who studies Torah regularly and fulfills mitzvahs with joy and love. Hadassim, the myrtles, whose stem is woody and thick and whose leaves smell so good. Its leaves are clustered in groups, united, united groups of three, with the top of the leaves of the bottom cluster covering the bottom of the leaves of the higher cluster. They have the appearance of being braided. Hadassim are symbolic of those who love doing mitzvahs and strengthen all of the Jews around them with their mitzvahs and kindness. They learn Torah as well, but much less they are busy doing. Aravos, the willows of the brook, commonly have reddish stems with clusters of two leaves up its stems. They grow bunched together and united in an, and in abundance. They have neither taste nor distinct smell. Aravos are symbolic of those whose involvement in Torah and mitzvahs are minimal. Which of these four kinds is most important? It would seem to be the lulav, the symbolic of Torah scholars. If the lulav is the top tier, why does the verse mention it second after the asterisk? Would you? Now Yitzhi goes off to his uh, commentary here. Would you rather be a hammer or a nail? On one hand, a nail is useless without a hammer. However, together they build something sturdy. With the hammer's influence, the nail is guided to, into its rightful place, and the nail will continue to serve its purpose long after the hammer is gone. Holding the piece together without the, na- without the nail hammer, without the nail, the hammer would be miserably locked up in its toolbox, accomplishing nothing. With nails, it can build many wonderful things. In the end, a hammer is useless without a nail, and vice versa. This is true for the four kinds. Remove any one of the four, and you have only three, and they are useless. No mitzvah can be done with three. Interesting note, only Aravas have any Jewish religious use on their own. On our third most holy day, Hashanah Rabba, we, f- we use five Aravas at the culmination of the service. During, Sukkot, during the Sukkot holiday, the altar in the temple was decorated with long Aravas. When the Torah speaks of the, of the daughters of Tzlavchad, it mentions them out of order to symbolize that they were equally great. Same for the four kinds. The Torah changes the order to teach us that they are equal in value. Same is for every Jew. Every one of us is necessary. We each have a unique part in the Jewish mission. The mission is incomplete without every Jew's contribution. So the Torah scholar needs the well-rounded Jew and the layperson, and they all need the less observant Jew. The value of every Jew is infinite. It is time to embrace every Jew. The Lulav, the Estrig, the Hadassim, and especially the Aravos, when we are united, we complete each other. When we are united in brotherly love, Hashem is overjoyed. Our unity to Him is irresistible. Therefore, our unity is what will bring Mashiach. May He come soon. So this is the uh, word for word, the article that Yitzhi wrote for Sukkot now on TorahForMyEyes.com with the title, um, Are are You a Hammer or a Nail? Uh, I'm going to hand it over to Laser. I'm going to go back and forth a little bit, but... uh, just, uh, just to say that, uh, Lazer, there's a lot, a lot, a, even though when you read it the first time, the first thought is, okay, we're just reading the basic medrash that that, that every, uh, so every Jew knows and the Rebbe talks about it so often, and it's inevitable that every every single sukkah's meal ends up uh, somehow we're, we're referencing back to the medrash, so it's pretty much the basics. But then when you start reading, again, what Yitzhi's writing here, and you go between, you know, sort of reading between the lines, there's a lot of information here that gives us a lot of a platform to bring about. Besides for the fact of the of the medrash itself, of the four kinds and what they represent, this whole thing about the hammer and the nail, you know, how which one is more important and what would you what would you rather be? Uh, and then how he ties it all together at the end. So I'm gonna hand it off to you to start with the discussion about it, and then I'll chime in and we'll go back and forth. And um, you know, if Yitzi has any magic with his from his eyes, if he wants to I'm sure, does he have a way, does he have a way to, if he makes a message that we'll be able to read what it says, someone will read it out for us? Masharan, do we have someone in Yitzi's room with him? Or does the computer generate voice? Oh, okay, good. Very good. So, you're absolutely right, Hershey, and we're going to Fabreng. We're pretty much Fabrenging in front of the world, whoever is on the live cast. 
And it's you and I for bringing, and everybody else is uh, chiming in, b'machshava, and Yitzi, whenever you can share with your eyes. But I want to start, first of all, by echoing everything Hershey said before, both b'negea to Yitzi, shirabit afu ashlema, b'ramach yevodav, shasagida, but Yeshua ashlema ukreva, and also to his rabbits and dina, they should give you kayach and gezunt to keep going. Every day is a struggle, and every day requires a heroic overcoming of incredible insurmountable challenges that nobody even can imagine and you keep going forward every day where you get the strength i don't know and the abisha should keep filling that hole with strength um you said to me many years ago dini that uh that when you're in a hole you want to do your best to keep getting as close as you can to the surface where the light is because it's so easy to just let go and slide down but who wants to be in the depth and the pits of darkness it's so easy, and yet it's so incredibly hard to keep pulling up. So Yitzi and Dina, what an inspiration you are to the world. Maybe she should give you kayak and a complete refor shlema, so we can go back and see the old Yitzi. This article, Hershey, I think you'll agree, it's quintessential Yitzi. Yitzi hasn't met a Jew he didn't love, and I would venture to say Yitzi didn't meet a person he didn't love, Jewish or not. I remember walking with you, Yitzi, in New Haven on a frigid winter night. It was dark, and it was a a poor fellow clearly wasn't Jewish. He was playing guitar. He had a guitar case open. There was hardly a quarter in the case because it was freezing. Nobody was walking by. And what did you do? You stopped. You sang with him. You took his guitar. You borrowed it from him. You played a song and you literally livened him up. Wow. Uh, I've told that story countless times. There was never a person that you met that you didn't love. And that's very clearly coming through in your in your Tvartera. Um, everyone knows what TaitaFromMyEyes.com is about. Every Everyone probably knows that Yitzi doesn't type and Yitzi doesn't talk. And Yitzi works through the magic of his eyes, through the magic of technology, where he can steer at a letter and, that, and the computer recognizes that's the letter he wants to type. But I don't know how many, maybe quite a few of us, have had the privilege of sitting with Yitzi and watching him do his magic and know how much time and effort and determination and gesund, it costs to write so much. Every week at Vartaira, true. But then every interaction, everything you want, everything you want to say, everything you want to ask, everything you want to everything you want to comment on. And it requires staring at these letters for a significant period of time until the computer acknowledges that that's the letter. Sometimes the computer guesses what you're trying to say and gets it wrong, and you have to start over again. And one day I was sitting with Yitzi. Yitzi, you may or you may not remember it, but I never forgot it. And I was watching you struggle your way through a simple sentence. And there I was alongside the computer trying to guess what's your next word. And you, it was taking forever. And I stopped and I said, Yitzi, isn't this a pain? And you erased the entire sentence you had been working on for like, I don't know, maybe two minutes. And you started a new sentence. And the new sentence was, isn't this a miracle? That is wow. powerful. I mean, that's, that's, that is the etem of Yitzi just bubbling up and why you're such an inspiration to everybody. And Zoldarebish together that you should, that your inspiration should really come to the fore. So Hershey, you're totally right. So many different pieces, the hammer nail. Also, I love this idea that the Torah puts the lulav second, even though the lulav is first and connection with B'nai Tzlovchad, that is wonderful, beautiful, a lot to think about. But I'll tell you, let's talk praktish. You know, the adava doesn't smell and doesn't have a taste, and the esvig has both, and the lulav and the hatas has one and not the other. Which would you rather be? I'm assuming the hammer nail business is connected also with the taita mitzvahs part. The hammer is probably taita, and mitzvahs is probably nail. For somebody who since COVID still doesn't smell and doesn't taste, one of my very big questions that I get asked is, which one do you miss most? And honestly, I can't really be sure. I think I miss taste a lot more than I miss smell, which means I miss taita a lot more than I miss mitzvahs. But that opens up the conversation to what does it mean that mitzvahs is a smell, a fragrance? And what does it mean that taita is a, is, is, is a taste, is, is a flavor? Um, it's much more than just a fragrance or a flavor. It's a question of whether it is an impact internally or an impact externally because a flavor impacts us from the outside in and a, sorry, a, a fragrance impacts us from the outside in 
and a, and a, and a, fla a flavor impacts us from the inside. As the Altarebbe says in Tanya and Pedakei, that when you learn Taita, it's v'seirascha b'seich meyoi. So it's really on the inside. Comes the question of which is taka more important? Which would you rather be? What's more important? Is it more important to learn or is it more important to do? The famous machlekas with Timbeshama and Vesilo and Nimnum Vagamro. That limud is, maybe, limud is greater because Limud is maybe Lide Maisa. So on the question of hammer and nail, it sounds like the nail is the best because the nail is what ultimately accomplishes the goal. You can swing your hammer from today to tomorrow. If you don't have a nail to drive into place, you've accomplished absolutely nothing. You could learn Taita from today to tomorrow if you don't have Maisa HaMitzvahs that it teaches you how to do, that it drives you to, then what did you accomplish? In fact, you can break things up. Yaltarebbe says in Tanya, because if you learn Torah Shalei Lishma, then your Torah remains not just in Elam Hazah, but not just in, not, not just in Elam Hasi it remains in Elam Hazah, that's under Tachas Madar HaKlipas. So like if the Torah is not Mevili De Maisa, then what does the Torah accomplish? If the hammer doesn't hit a nail, if, if the Limud is not Mevili De Maisa, then the object, the object is the nail. But yet, Yitzi's point is not, which would you rather be, the hammer or the nail? Yitzi's point is, as somebody said to me earlier in our sukkah, we were having a conversation, I asked, which would you rather be, hammer or nail? He says, the hammer is not the goal and the nail is not the goal. The goal is the building you're trying to put up. It's the it's what you're serving. In this case, it's the Ebishter. Whether you're serving him through Limud or you're serving him through Misa, it's everything together. And that's why Yitzi's point comes out so strong, that without a hammer, without a nail, you have sort of neither. What do you think? Yeah, that sounds that, that was very profound. Thank you. You know, I think that Yitzi's probably sitting there thinking, OK, but, you know, I was really just trying to generate conversation with the with my question about the hammer and nail, because the point that he brings out at the end is that none, not there's no one that's better than the other, because ultimately everyone is the same and everyone is equal and we need each other. And it's all about the message of unity and everyone together and everybody has won. So, you know, that 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 is ultimately what he's trying to bring out is the value of every single individual um and without differentiation about you know who's the more important who's the less important one with the b'nai tzlavchat hashem turns around this the order so just you know i want i i had a very interesting uh, little episode one day in the airport that really drove home that point to me somehow about the value because really the you know the, the question becomes the real question here is about the arava you know because the 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 lulav the guy that that's a ben Torah and he's learning and he's into learning and what he brings to the table is Torah scholarship and limited Torah so we're very clear about what he brings to the table and the esrog of course the guy that has both the kol shikem and he's got everything so we're clear also and the the the, the, the hadasim but the arav is the one that has essentially nothing nothing at least of value that they bring into the table that's really the question where do they fit into this bundle and how could it be that they're equally as important as important as the rest. And I'm yet, the guy. I can't smell and I can't taste. I'm the essential. <laughs> but you're also humble because I see all the swarm in back of you, and I think you probably sit and learn a little, a little bit more. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like your smicha. It's, it's in my back. <laughs> I oh, so taka for bringing in here. I see a public for bringing in. Uh, <laughs> in. In any event, so a, a, um, a couple of months ago, I was traveling with. I was traveling to New York, and I had my little baby with me. Baruch Hashem, now she's nine months, at that time she was six months, and this has been the story of my life now for Baruch Hashem, uh, 23 years, my oldest is 23 years old, traveling with little kids has already been, a, for, for, for a long time already, that's, you know, that, that's been my story, and in the early years, and only up until very recently, a, a child under the age of two flies for free, you don't buy a ticket for them, and the way it worked until very recently was that uh, you got to the airport, you had a little baby with you, they went with you on the plane, and they sat with you on the on your lap and finished. And then recently, and I don't know exactly when it was, but over somehow in the last short uh, couple of years, they made it so that the little babies, the infants that are going on the plane, even though they go for free, they have to have a boarding pass. 
And for me, that created a lot of hardship because I'm always a last minute guy when I come to the airports, the last minute we're running and you can't get the boarding pass for the baby in advance on your computer. You have to do it at the kiosk. Some of your lines, you got to do it on the kiosk when you get to the airport. So one such flight a couple of months ago, I get there at the last minute and we're rushing, rushing, rushing. And then we get there and finally, and, so on, and then we get to the gate. I didn't have a, a boarding pass for it. We got through security, but when it came to the gate, actually, uh, you know, rushed to your plane and they stopped and said, where's the boarding pass for the baby? So I was really annoyed. It was one of those mornings where I really was, you know, maybe I didn't have my coffee in time that day. And I went over to the gate agent and I said, can you please tell me why this baby needs to have a boarding pass? She's not a paying passenger. She's sitting on my lap. What did she need to have a boarding, boarding pass for? And the lady looked at me and said, she's also a soul. She needs to be accounted for. And that was a moment that, that was a nice lesson to me. A young little child, a three, four, five month old child that really in this plane, in this story of the plane, it doesn't really, you know, doesn't have any kind of significance, not a paying passenger, not taking up any space. And it never was like that. But every soul needs to be accounted for. And in a certain sense, the Arava, including the Arava and understanding that the Arava is, is part of all four and equally the same, is a recognition of that idea that every single soul has a place around the table, whether they're old enough, and not just physically, but maturity-wise, spiritually, whether they're old enough that they bring something to the table, whether it's the lulav with the Torah and the mitzvahs, and or with both and the smell and the fragrance, or whether there's nothing really there, just an existence of a life, ultimately, they all are equally as important, and they're bound together, and they, um, you know, they, they have to be accounted for. Not only accounted for, we recognize that there's no hammer is better than the nail. The nail, but in the hammer, they all they all play an important role, and they're all bound together. And without one, you can't say a bracha on any of them. So that's the first thought. And one more thought, and then again, we'll, we'll you know pass back to you, and we'll, we'll we'll bounce it around a little. The other the other very interesting thought is that um, Yitzi actually mentions in his article that the other three items don't have any mitzvah role that they play on their own. The lulav, there's nothing you could do with the lulav mitzvah-wise, unless it's together with all four. There's nothing with the uh, with, with, hadas, with, with the hadasim and with the esrig. The only one that actually has a place in the davening, in the worship, and in the service is the aravas. When it comes to Shaina Rabbah, we make a whole ceremony out of it. And like Gitsi described, the basic they used to use Aravas for a decoration, long Aravas. So you see, in fact, that not only is the simple one also also bound together and also has value, but the simple one actually is the one that has primary value to the point that it has independent inherent value versus the other ones that only have value when they're being bound together. And there's a lot of ways how we understand this, you know, in Hasidic it talks about the fact that they, the simple one is the one that has the moon of shutta, the simple faith. It's not unencumbered with, with logic and, and deep thinking. It just, it, it's a, a raw core belief in connection to Hashem, despite not having any of the, of the fragrance and the smell. So terrible, you know, the Rebbe writes in Asicha, in the Kota Sichas, that a shyness would happen even on Shabbos. Lulav and the Lulav and Esfik doesn't happen on Shabbos. That's why we always make sure the Luach is arranged that the Shine Rabbi never falls on Shabbos. Because the Emes, if it fell on Shabbos, the shyness would happen even on Shabbos. The Arava is Deicha Shabbos, even though wow. the Lulav wow. and Esfik is not, because the Amunabshutta is the durable piece. Right. That's Kiyum. Right. So, so, so then you, then you, so then you wonder to yourself, one second, so how does that? How does the science of that work? I mean, is it just nice words that you want? We want to be nice, especially with Chabad. So we love this madrash because everyone is embraced. Even the simple guy is embraced. Like, how does that work? In reality, the Lulav is the guy that's the Ben Torah. He's the Gadol. He, he, and like Yitzhi describes, he stands tall. He's giving off the light to the world. He's a uh, personifies Torah. And, and then... And the bracha on the Tilas Lulav. And they say bracha on the Tilas Lulav. Right, because there is a certain significance to him, and the, and and the hadassim is the one that has the smell, so it's filled with nice, beautiful mitzvahs, and the esek has both. So what's taka the pshat that that the arava that has nothing is number one in the first phase of it, you know, in the elementary level of it, also included. But then as we advanced even in this conversation, not only also included, but prominent, and it has its own its own part of the davening and hashanah rabba and. Um, 
and and what's it called? And like you said, we're reading Bidoich Shabbos, and and there was a good word going around uh, before Yontif. There was a good word go, word going around that the Aravis is the only one that ends up on top of Darin Kodesh. After Yontif yeah. is over, after Yontif is over, the the the, the little gets either you throw it in the garbage or you burn it in the chametz later before Pesach. And the same thing, for, but the Arav is there on top of the, the uh, Aram Kodesh. How exactly does it work? What's the what's the science behind that? And the idea, rate basically, again, is it's something that it's some it's a simple point, but we take our mind off of it sometimes. We take our eyes off of it, unless you tore from my eyes. The idea, really, basically, is that we get lost thinking that our relationship with Hashem is tied to the things that we do and to our achievements. So whether it's through our learning or through our davening or through our mitzvahs, we get lost thinking that that's where the relationship is. And comes along the story with our others by taking the one that doesn't have nothing, doesn't have anything, and recognizing not only that it has, that it's, it should be there too, and you can't make a bracha without me, but even more that I have my own, my own service and I go on top of it on Kurdish, recognizing that, that our relationship with Hashem has nothing to do Ultimately, it's like like the famous Mishalom with the parent and the child. There's a part of you that likes your child because of what they do and the grades that they get in school and the cute things that they say and, and the chores that they do in the home and they respect you, this and that. There's a part of us that connects in that way. But at the core of our existence, our relationship with our child, our children, Baruch Hashem, is, is just because they're our children and we love them nothing to do with anything they ever do or don't do that bond is there and that is what the embrace of the Aravis is all about is to remind us it's yes it's true you have to have trade and you have to have mitzvahs and we all strive and we bond them together so that Esri should have an inspiration uh, should inspire and rub off on that Alts emes all true but ultimately ultimately the bond with Hashem the connection is only because of our etzim our essence and the only one that really rec- uh, symbolizes that is the Aravis, because it doesn't have anything else to show. That's why it play- it's such a prominent thing. So uh, that's why, I mean, Yitzhi so beautifully brought this together about the, each one without the other. You have to have them all. But then he also highlights a little bit the Aravis with, with, uh, with the Hishinus and everything, because I think that that's an important part uh, to remember about the Aravis. So you talk about the, the core connection of parent to child, which is ir- what regardless of the child's achievements or lack thereof, or even, even the opposite of achievements, reminds me of the Sikha from Parsha Shmais and the Kota Sikhas about the difference between B'ni B'cheri Yisrael and Nar Yisrael V'ayaveyu. The Rebbe says that the love between a parent and a child is just a muscle of the love between the Ebishter and Yidin to help us relate to the love that the Ebishter has for Yidin. Like the Moshem Tev said, like a, like a parent who has a Ben Yaki that is older in his older age. And the Rebbe says that when the children are babies, then the core of the relationship is there because they've achieved nothing. So why do you love them? Why is this my child? I mean, like, why am I so proud of them? This is my child. I'm going to show off the pictures. This is my little one. Why? Because it's my pocket, my kind. When they get older, sometimes that gets covered over by their achievements. You start saying, my child, the doctor, my child, the dog, my child, the aid, my Adam the shliach. It gets covered over. It doesn't mean that the core is gone, but it's harder to zero in on it because the the outside achievements be, start taking up space in our minds, and we're proud of them for their achievements. But the core is always there, and I think that's what's so true about Yitzi, the core connection. Right now, Yitzi, you're not shy to like tell your children in too many words all the things that make them make you proud of them. But your children, each one of them knows that core, deep connection of a father to a child. That is still there. And you know, I, I've watched them come home. I've watched them walk over to you. I've watched their interaction with you. It's totally the core. Reminds me of a story I heard from Mendy Mangel from Cherry Hill. If you're on, then um, you'll know that the, the Maisa is Emes. You told me the Maisa. It's a Givaldika story, this, the Chmaine Rakin story. It was a, there was a Yid from Williamsburg, I think. I don't remember exactly which Chassidus, uh, but it was not a Lubavitcher. And he asked Mendy, the Shliach, if this is a minion of Shemesh Shabbos Yidin. I'm sure we've all gotten that question. <clears throat> and so it so happened to be that it was a minion of Shemesh Shabbos Yidin. So Mendy told him, yeah, it's a minion of Shemesh Shabbos Yidin. But as a shleich of the Rebbe, this bothered him. I mean, it's like the value system is so different. It's beautiful. We take it for granted. We don't even think about it. 
I mean, the fact that it would bother a yid that he would daven with a minion made up of yidin that are not don't care enough not into bishem shabbos is a beautiful halakhazach. Like he really regards highly teda. In other words, what we were saying before, the the achievements of the yid, how much the yid is demonstrating his love for the Abish. I'm going to daven, and my minion is going to be comprised of people who don't take time to demonstrate their love for the Abish. But what is a shliach's approach? Every single person here is that Abish is akin, right? So it bothered, it bothered Mandy. So he's not showing it. Today's Rambam. Is it today or is it yesterday? About with a, with, with a carbon. Someone says, Are oila. And he doesn't give it. Why? The Rambam explains in the because that's the etzim of the yid. So he didn't show it yet. So he's going to show it. That's his etzim. That's a shliach's approach. And does irrespective of how many mitzvahs we do or don't do, even in that oven. So Mendy goes over to this El Tariyid, Ramish and El Tariyid, Azayda. And he says to him, Let me ask you a question. He says, Baruch Hashem, can I know how to many? He says, uh, Here Mendy was going out on a limb, obviously. He says, They're all Afenderech. He says, No, Leider Nisht. A few of them are not. He says, Let me ask you a question. Ilya Tsuria Enikloch got together. And they made a minion. All of your iniklach together, those who are from and those who are not, but they wanted to daven with you in the same minion. Would you answer amen to such a kaddish? Would you say baruchu? He says, yeah, my iniklach all wanted to come to a minion. Of course, of course. So Mandy asks him, so why is it that you would daven with your iniklach, but you have a problem with Avram Avinu's iniklach? That's the Arava. Avram Avinu is an article. It's the Chmayin Rakind. Right? It reminds me of the Misa um, of, uh, I can't remember who it was. A Shliach was putting on film with someone in the Kaisal. I'm thinking it was Ginsberg, Aaron Ginsberg from, uh, from Borough Park. And if somebody knows I'm wrong, then correct me. He was putting on film with someone in the Kaisal. And he sees he's getting the evil eye from a uh, film Yid. And so afterwards, he walks over to me and says, I see you're bothered. With, what's your problem? So he says, you're putting on tefillin with kaifrim, with kayim. So he says, let me ask you a question. If this guy drives through your neighborhood on Shabbos, would you throw a rock at him? He says, avada, what's para vlage? So he says, no. So for putting on tefillin, he's a guy. But for driving on Shabbos, he's a yid. For throwing a rock at him, he's a yid. It's like, it's it's the quintessential dev attitude that the adava is absolutely the highest. That, that, that You can't get better than that. You know, I you told the story of going with your baby on the plane. So this Rosh Hashanah, I gave a drasha. So I said over a joke about how somebody called the, the, the flight attendant and asked if he could change his seat because the baby was crying. It turns out it doesn't work if it's your own child. <laughs> if it's somebody else's child crying, so then it bothers you. Why is he crying? I'm like, I'm, I paid money for this. I'm tired. I want to sleep. But if it's mine that I can't. And the tears sound different, right? My heart's crying with him. But Ebesh is in that other. The Ebesh is connected with him. Every minute he's not doing a mitzvah. In Yavayin Nitzvah love. Mabit love. Beichin Klayas Belev. In Ev De Karoi. The Ebesh is focused on this Arava. And you feel it more in the Arava because it doesn't get clouded over by the achievements of the Esrig and the Lulav. Those are achievements that cloud over the core connection. Is um, it's a sicha from the Rebbe. That was a sicha on which I based that drasha. It was um, from Mem Aleph, Erev Shavuos, a gewaldic sicha. And the Rebbe talks about the story, the famous story that the Alter Rebbe, that the middle Rebbe's child fell out of the cradle. And both the Alter Rebbe upstairs and the middle Rebbe downstairs were the only ones awake and they were learning. And the middle Rebbe was so engrossed that he couldn't hear the sound of the crying child. <coughs> Now Rebbe heard, he came downstairs, took care of the child, put him back to sleep. And the next morning, Dalt Rebbe tells the Mitzvah Rebbe that you could never be so engrossed in your learning that you don't hear the sound of a crying child. Powerful, powerful story. Everybody knows the Misa. The Rebbe comes along and says that when a kind, a little kind, and the Rebbe says the same is true of an elderly person who is still a child in Dalt Mitzvah. He comes along and he asks you, what's the brach on, on, on water? What's going on here? This is the child who fell from his cradle to the floor. It's a neshama that fell. And 
And this is the child, this Hadava is the crying child. And we're so caught up in our need to daven with the minion of Shem Rishabas that we can't feel the pain of this crying neshama, this baby Shpizakind. So this beautiful thought about the Arava and how it encapsulates the core of Ayid's connection with the Abishter. Lots of ways to express this connection, but the core encapsulates the connection. And Taka, that's why the Arava is Deicha Shabbos, only the Arava. When the Arava is mixed in with the others, not Deicha Shabbos, because you don't feel the core, because you, you get caught up with all the achievements, the Taita, the this, the that. When it's just the Arava, the core shines very strong. That's beautiful, Shekayach. You know, I guess we, we, we're taking this in that direction to be talking about uh, the power of the Arava and Yitzi. I hope that um, that you're okay with that, with the direction that we're going here. I know you had two different conversations here about uh, which one is more important and then about the power of the Arava. I had a very interesting story also that was very inspirational to me. Uh, last year, there was um, a woman in our community came to me and asked me that her father who never really was too much, she, she's a Balas Tshuva, not even fully yet, she's on the journey, but her parents are totally not involved uh, with, with Tere in an in a, in a active, regular way. So her father was very sick and he was in the hospital and he didn't have much time left. And it's out of nowhere, one day he said to her that he would like to see a rabbi. So she was all excited and thrilled because here she is, she, this lady's in her probably 50s, not a young kid, you know, not a teenager, and she discovered Taira and Mitzvahs, and she's trying to grow, and uh, she's always trying to encourage her parents also, but she really hasn't had any movement with that, and um, and all of a sudden, the father's saying, you want to see a rabbi, and granted, even though it's the end of his life, and the stat, you know, you hear all these stories, people, they look for it, but still to her, she was very excited, so she says to me, you know what, fine, I'll, I'll call my rabbi, he'll come over to the hospital, you'll talk with him, everything's going to be fine. So I go over to the hospital, I'm sitting and chatting with him, you know, and I say the regular stuff, and I say shema, all that stuff. So then she had a sense that maybe the reason why he wanted to see a rabbi wasn't just regular because he was feeling like he was close to the end of his life, and that's the Seder, you know, that's what you do, you get in touch with a rabbi. She had a feeling that there was something that she wanted to speak to the rabbi about, like a personal matter. So she says to him, uh, this, is about, this is about a year ago, this time, it was right after Tishrei last year. So she says to him, after the, the light chit-chat and all that stuff, and after we said some Tehillim and then Shema, she says, do you want me to go out of the room? Is there anything you wanted to talk to Rabbi about? So he says, actually, yeah, I do want to talk to the Rabbi about something, but you don't need to go out of the room, you could stay in the room also. So she stays in the room, and... and we start, you know, it gets a little serious, and then he says to me the following thing. You now, this guy is probably in his 80s, and um, he's by the end of his life, and when he's fully coherent at this point, he passed away a couple of days later, he says to me, I have something I'm carrying around for 40 years, 35, 40 years, that I feel very, very guilty about, and I need to talk to you about it. So now I'm already getting uncomfortable because I don't know what's going to come out of his mouth and I don't know if I'm going to have it to respond. <laughs> a guy, you know, he's carrying some sort of guilt for 40 something years, 30 to 30, 40 years. But, you know, you, you call to the spot and you have to, that's what you have to do. So I say, okay, go ahead. So this is what comes out of his mouth. He tells me that it was in the 80s and he took his daughter, this girl, that isn't the daughter that's now in the room and she's Balash Truva. She, let's say she's in the 50s. She was a teenager then. Maybe she's 60 now even. She was a young, a young maybe she was 12, 13 years old. She took her, she, he took her to a concert somewhere. He was either in Madison Square Garden or maybe he mentioned a place called Seton Hall. Epps, he took her to some sort of show. After it was over, they, they leave and they're walking to go to the train, to go to the parking lot, wherever it was they were going to. And he said there was one of those um, Lubavitch people with a mitzvah truck. You know, <laughs> there was a there was a, there was a there was a mitzvah tank over there. One of these Lubavitch people, they're standing over there and they're stopping Jews and they're laying to fill in with them. And he says that as I was walking by with her, she won't remember. 
they asked me, excuse me, sir, are you Jewish? So I knew it's a true story because we all did this when we were kids, right? Even the Lashonis, the way he was, the way he was, he said, um, excuse me, sir, are you Jewish? And I was not in the mood of putting on tefillin. I'm not a religious guy, especially with my daughter is that. So I said, no, I'm not. And I walked away. And he said, 40 something years, this is on my conscience. How did I ever utter out of my mouth those words that I'm not a Jew? Just because I wanted to get away with putting on tefillin that day with that guy. It was incredible. It was incredible to have that moment experience. A guy in his late 80s, he has no reason to go to go like stomp, pull a, uh, an emotional story here. It's the end of his life. He tells his daughter from nowhere all of a sudden he wants to see a rabbi. By the way, he doesn't know that this rabbi is going to be a Lubavitcher also. I tell him for a joke. I tell him, I know those people. I'll get you atonement. Don't worry about it. I'll let them know you, I'll let them know you didn't mean it. Don't worry about it. But to me, it was such a powerful... Hershey, I will bet that you were that buffer. <laughs> Maybe. Halavai, that would be a compliment that I take a, did the Tzoyim for serious a couple of times without running to the pizza store. But that would be incredible if we ever could trace it back to that, because it was back in the mid-80s, so the timing would work. But could you imagine, and this is the Arava, you know, we think that the Lulav, the one that's actively uh, learn, learning and involved with his learning, and the one that's the Esrig, or the Hadassim, and you could, it's Kentic on them, it's recognizable that they're people with Torah Mitzvahs, and they're into Yiddishkeit, they're the ones that have the fragrance, the smell, they're the ones that belong in the bundle. But the Arava, what does he have? Okay, we're being nice, we're putting him in also, fine, you have to welcome every Jew. But over here, we're talking something else. Over here, we spoke to now for the last uh, 40 minutes, whatever it is, that the Arava is it. In this Arava is where you see the raw purity of what means a connection to Hashem, not tied to anything else. 40-something years he's carrying around the guilt and on his deathbed, he wants to take care of it, that how could he have ever uttered from his mouth that he is not a Jew, even though he didn't mean it. You know, the Maisa with the, the official Maisa that they say about the Kal Nidre or, or the Nisana Tekev, you know, with the Ramnan, they say, say it's not a true story. I don't know, whatever, but the point is, this, it's like a, a, a story like from Amol. He didn't even mean it, and it was bothering him till then. So when we talk about the Arava, we talk about, you know, Yitzhi asks, who's more important, the hammer or the nail? Maybe it's not the hammer and not the nail, and maybe it's the wood that it's going into, the Shtick Holtz. Maybe that piece of wood that doesn't have any life that the hammer and nail are are, are are going into and creating something with, that's the one that's the most important. We don't know. But but we know what we know what what, what Torah tells us and what Yiddish guy tells us. Yiddish guy tells us you bring together everybody, you bring them together in this one way, everyone together, and that other has a certain sense of importance more than the others. Like you said before, it's the Cheshabis, it ends up at Tabadan and Kredush, it has its own its own uh, little uh, minig or whatever mitzvah that we do with the Hishainis and Hishainis Rabbah, never, ever, ever underestimate the power of the Arava. And I want to just say one other thought, and then I would like to hear from you a little bit more as well. I know we're running out of time soon. I, I came across a, an incredible insight somewhere, I forgot even where I read it, that in, in the in the Kriya Satayra, one of the places in the Chumash where it talks about uh, the Yom Toivim, is in is in what's it called? Is in is in Parshas A, right? So over there, where it speaks about the 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 three times that you had to go Eil Regal and bring Kabbanas to the base of Mikdash, so you find a very very interesting nuance. And the nuance is that when it speaks about Pesach, it says that you should take all your Kabbanas El Hamokim Asher Yivcha Hashem Alekecha, take it to the place that Hashem chooses, which is the base of Mikdash. What did Hashem choose it for? Lishakin Shmoi Shom. That his name should be established over there. Take it to the place of Hashem Alekecha, that Hashem chooses Lishakin Shmoi Shom to put his name there. By Shvuas, the same exact thing, two, three psukim later, it says again that Hager Yasam, take it again, to the place that Hashem chooses Lishakin Shmoi Shom to establish his name there. When it comes to Sukkis, that Lashak and Shmoy is, is missing. It just says that you should take Shivas, Yamim, Tochak, Shom, Kachab, Makim, Ashiv, Hashem, Kibarech, Ravayisach, Sameach. Take it to the place that Hashem chooses, but the detail that he chose it, Lashak and Shmoy that's missing. It's not there. 
So the question, of course, everything like that in Torah, if it's missing, it stands out. It's so glaring that by Pesach and Shavuos, it, it, it describes the Besamekish as being the place that he chose, L'shakesh Mishram, same by Shavuos, and by Emei Sukkot, it just says that he chose Shuyivchar, then by Yisach Sameach. So one of the, one of the Mepharshim explain that the reason why over here is, because by, by, by Pesach and Shavuos, where is Taka Hashem resting his presence? In the base of Mikdash. You come there, you Hashem, and well, everyone's there doing their thing, and that's where he's resting his presence. But on Sukkot, the Abish is not limited to only the base of Mikdash. Every single Yid that makes a Sukkah, Hashem is dwelling over there. So the Shaken Shmoy Sham wouldn't fit because Makoshiv Hashem, the Vesmikdash is not the only place where Hashem rests his presence. He's resting it in every place where every person makes a sukkah. And why that's phenomenal also, because if you think about it, in the building of a sukkah, Viter, everybody's the same. You know, when it comes to the way you do certain mitzvahs, people are Mahadir, are nicer, Esrig, are nicer, Luliv, the matzah, the machine matzah, the round matzah, the Hanukkah, you like with candles, you like with oil, you like the whole family, you only like one for the family. Every little thing. When it comes to a sukkah, what are we? We're carpenters. We all build the same exact Poshet sukkah, the Tzaddik. And the Godel and the Mashpia and the Shliach and John. And the hammer and the nail. And with, oh, with the hammer and the nail. Beautiful. Thank you. That was very good. Uh, that was very good. I didn't think of that. Every we, Everyone takes the same hammer, the same nail, and builds a sukkah. And the Abisha says, Lashak and Shmoy Shom. I'm not just in the basement. I go to every single one of those sukkahs. I go. I'm not Mechalik if it's the sukkah of the Tzadik or the sukkah of the Benini or the sukkah of the Arava. I'm not Mechalik. Because they're all equally the same. Because that's the whole power. That's the whole power of what Sukkot is all about. Sukkot is all about again the embrace, the unity, everything that Yitzhi's talking about in his article. So it's just it's just very very refreshing things to think about, and it's for us very it's for us very very important to to reconnect with that way of thinking because we could get lost, you know, because the reality is Torah Mitzvahs, uh, Yiddishkeit is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a Yiddishkeit, a religion of, of action, of Maes of Apoel, of Mitzvahs Maesias. So are, we do have to live every day trying to do more and trying to learn more and trying to do more Mitzvahs and getting close to Hashem in that way, but we, it can never come at the expense of taking our eyes off and forgetting ultimately what really is our connection all about, and the connection is all about the essence and the core, and the Arava is the one that personifies it most. And in a certain sense, that guy in the hospital at 80 something years old, having deep regret because 40 years earlier he uttered out of his mouth that I'm not a Jew, he didn't even mean it, just wanted to get home faster. And you know, and, and that, that purity of how much it really bothered him um, really, really is an eye opener to us about the power of the Arava. Beautiful story. Phenomenal, phenomenal story. And connection to the sukkah is also fantastic. I want to focus in again on Ashreinu Matev Chalkeinu, that when we hear a story like that, that's the piece that jumps out at us in such a clear way that it hits us between the eyes. And there's no other way to translate the story. We have no clue that the rest of the Frum of Velt is going to look at a story like that and is not going to see the Pintaliyid. They're going to say, never, ever say you're not a Jew because it's going to plague you for 40 years. <laughs> and if you're lucky, you'll get it out before 40 years are up and you'll punk to happen to run into Lubavitcher and ask him Mechila. And if Chas for Shalom, you didn't do that, you're going to get fried. <laughs> That's what they're going to think about. Because again, they're, they're only thinking about the, the mice of the pile. But the Rebbe trained us, Ashrein and Matev Cholkeinu, that we think differently. We definitely, we think in a in a way that's connected to the Etzim and Neshama, and that's going deeper. What's inside the Maisa Bapayal? It's bringing our Etzim and Neshama to be the bottle, the Likalol Be'ravaya. And it comes out in the story like the one you told. It's just a phenomenal, phenomenal story. But only, only if you think about it like that. Only if you think about it like that. That is very true. I didn't even think of that. That's real true. Like we're so trained to see it that way that it was just a given that that's the way I saw it. But you're probably right. Another way of looking at it probably would have been, you know, don't uh, don't even think of ever denying your existence because it's going to plague you your whole life. Right. Right. There's a podcast called Stories to Inspire. Yeah. Recently, Maishi Brisky started posting stories there. So it's mamish like a breath of fresh air. 
But some of the other stories that come out, these like phenomenal stories, like the one you just told, but the story gets so twisted in, in a very different way. So the Rebbe trained us. It's Mamish the Ashrenu Matev Volcano. You see a Bacharol, a 14-year-old, whose entire chayas on Sukkot, after he's exhausted from Simchas Pesha Sheva dancing, and what brings a light to his eyes and a smile to his face that a Pasha to Yid on a street corner lit the Shuk Lulav. And what totally devastates and disappoints him is that he didn't find a Yid to help him do this mitzvah. The Ashrenu Matev Volcano element is just so powerful here. And, and you find it in the Arava. You find, and, and I really, I bet you that you were that. It would, I mean, the story is just, it's begging for that ending. I just heard a story from Yossi Mack. By the way, I'll just say, I definitely had a lot of rejection of him. So <laughs> <laughs> I got a lot of no's. It's very possible that this was him. Oh, we also got no's from Yidden, who were very clearly right. saying. <laughs> right. But, uh, I just heard a story from Yassi Maris. Again, a beautiful way of how the Rebbe brings things together from different times. Um, Yassi Maris, he's on Shlichus in San Antonio. And he recently started a Chabadas in his own area. And there was someone that moved in, that, that was living in his part of town, who has been very, very helpful to him since he moved in. Extremely, extremely helpful to him. Yassi actually gave me the shows to tell the story. So I'm sharing. I don't I don't have the names. He didn't give me the names. And it's, it's not, it's not Negea. But the point is, Yossi asked him once, where did you get introduced to Chabad? So he said the first time he had a connection was with Rabbi Yossi Megalnik in Palos Verdes in California, that he had a relative, passed away at a young age. He went to the Levaya, Rabbi Megalnik did the Levaya, and a few months later, her daughter, her son had a bar mitzvah, and he went to the bar mitzvah, and it was a beautiful bar mitzvah. That was his first connection with Chabad. So Yossi Maris asks him, when? When did your cousin pass away? And he tells him when it was, and it was, I can't remember if it was Nun Gimel or Nun Dalit. And, and Yassi says to him, you know what? I was a chazan, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, in Palace Verdes, Nun Gimel and Nun Dalit. And Rabbi Megalnik said to me, after davening, there's an old lady, and she's talking very unwell, and we should walk to her, and we should blow shayfer for her. And we walked in the heat for two hours each way, no, two miles each way, and we blew Shaifa. And she was very moved that we came. And she pointed to her boy, who was 12 years old, and she told Rabbi Megalnik, when, when I pass away, and he's 13, you must promise to make a bar mitzvah for me. Wow. So Yossi called, Yossi Maris called Yitzhi Megalnik right away and asked him, like, of course, the Balabas gave him the name. He asked him, is this the name of the lady we went to together? And Yitzhi confirmed, that's it. And here, Yossi went schlepping for two miles each way in the heat on Rosh Hashanah to go do a mitzvah for a yid. Turns out, what, 40, nearly 40 years later, that he's starting his own chabadas, and this lady's kadav happens to be living, and because he had a positive exposure to chabad, now he's helping him. Unbelievable. Like closing a circle of 40 years, nearly 40 years. So isn't it amazing that this guy wanted to get it off his chest and he got it off his chest to a Lubavitch kid. Is he still alive, by the way? No, no, no. He passed away a couple of days later. It's a couple of days later. Unbelievable. If, if this story comes, like if somebody publishes this story, I mean, it's a very inspiring story. A very highly, highly inspiring story. All, all thanks to Yitzi and this podcast. We got, if I, got, I, got, I got a chance to tell it the first time. Aha, so now it has to be on a Hershey bar. Oh, that there you go. Um, you know, I just because we're coming close to the end, I just want to hop around before we don't have time to say something to Yitzi. Uh, two things. The first thing is that, um, I don't know if I'm sure he remembered, Yitzi, Yitzi, I'm sure you remember, but Simcha's base of Sheyeva in Crown Heights, of course, which is the highlight today of, uh, uh, not today, for the last 30, 40 years of, of the Simcha of Sukkot in the streets of Crown Heights, that people come from all communities and uh, there's thousands and thousands of people and it goes throughout the whole night. It's world famous. I mean, um, even my kids wanted to go to New York to be able to be part of it and to see it. So in the first year that it started, uh, I'm not good with years, maybe it was Mem and Malik and Bay, maybe somebody could put it in the comments over there, but the first year that it started, the Rebbe spoke that the Shreve Simcha and, and the dancing in the streets, and a few people started dancing in the street of Montgomery and Kingston. Now, me and Yitzi live on that block. So I live three houses off the corner, and Yitzi is three more houses down, so six houses down. 
and Yitzi was very, very into this whole thing. Remember, this is before it became big. So, you know, 5, 10, 15 people would gather in the street and they would dance for an hour, two or three, and then they never heard about it, was very happy. So Yitzi, and Yitzi's grandfather, Zayd Chaim Tashkent, is a Lebedic guy, of course, if you remember him. So Yitzi would, after the meal, well, he would finish, I don't know if he would finish his meal fast, I don't know what went on in the house, if he rushed them or didn't rush them, but Yitzi would come knocking on my door, that we have to go, we have to start the dancing. By the corner, he'd bring his Zayd Chaim Tashkent, he was always up for a good tencel. You know, the old style Chiddush tencel, where you had your hand around the shoulder, you went in a circle, and countless nights in the first year or two, Myself and Yitzi and Chaim Tashkenter, all thanks to Yitzi, when I was I was in my house lazy, you know, uh, enjoying my meal, but he would come knocking and go, we gotta go, we gotta go. We're starting to dance in some Vesheva. I don't even, even know if we called it some Vesheva back then, but he would knock on my door and we would go. And uh, from that, it grew, of course, into what it is today. So it's uh, it's something that I always remember very fondly. And Yitzi has a very, very big schus that the thousands and thousands of people uh, that dance in the streets till today. There was a video going on from last night. You saw it when they were singing. That was all the Zun signs. Like must be like thirty thousand people on the street there. But we then there was ten people or three people. Um, I remember David Brinol was shown. He would come also somehow. He was one of the people that show up early. But the Yitzi would knock on my door, we would go. So that's, Sukkah is always a time that I think very fondly about, always thinking about Yitzi. But just these nights of Sukkah, I, I always think back to those nights back then. We were less than Bar Mitzvah, we were little kids. That's the first thing. The second wow, thing. I never even asked myself who was the founder of Sukkah's Pesach Shev. I always thought you said all Shem to. Here no, no, you saw Shem came along and started, and started being like a community organizer. I'm not going to say we were the founders, but there were three, we four were. people. We would go and make sure that we have first dance, 100%, 100%. This is my memory from my youth. That, that, uh, the other thing I want to say quickly, a little bit, maybe a little bit more uh, deeper with a vart, is that um, you know, there's a vart about sukkahs, that the word sukkah, so samach and hey, the outside letters, is 65, which is Hashem's name, Adnai, is Gematia 65. And the inside letters, Vav and Chaf, is 26, is Yudke Vavke. So Adna, Yudke Vavke, are, the outside is like the sort of the lower level of Hashem, the, the 26 is Yudke Vavke, the two letters of Hashem, the sukkah represents all the elements of Hashem. And then together, what is, what's 65 and 26? 91. So what 91, 91, the Gematia from 91 is Tsei. Tsei means to go out. You go out into the sukkah. You go out into the sukkah, you're going into Hashem's embrace you know the two names of hashem but what i want to say to yitzi is that I, and i said this i think by your 40 by your the party for your 50th birthday i think i said it then but i want to say with a different audience here now that right after you got sick you right after you got diagnosed you were still mobile and walking and talking but it was starting to hit you uh you came to new york because there was a bar mitzvah for one of your children and um they asked me to be mc of the of the bar mitzvah so i flew in and i was there and it was a very, very inspirational moment to watch the way you handled, uh, you know, this new life that you were walking into. But I remember like yesterday, remember like yesterday, what you, one of the things you said in your speech, that you said that Hashem told Avraham, say hachutza, go outside and look up and see the stars. And just like you can count them, that's how you're koyu zarecha. So you asked the question, if Hashem wanted to show him the stars, why did I tell him to step outside? Just open the window, look outside, you see the stars. Why? By Yoytzei HaChutzei, took him outside, and over there he told him to look up to the stars and told him that, just like you can't count, it, and I remember you said that um, that the Eibishter was telling Avraham that to be a Yid is to walk out of the Hagbalas of Elam Haza. He told him, go out, because inside here you can find in a box, but if you go outside, over there, you'll be, able to, you'll be able to see the impossible. That's why he told him to go outside. So Sukkot is Tsei. Sukkot is 91 to go out. And in the Sukkot, we have the Kayach of the Eberster, Adna and Yudke Vavke, all the levels of Hashem, the bleak vul, where the impossible can happen. So the, the bracha that you gave to yourself back then, it's now, unfortunately, it's already, what is it, 11 or 12 years ago, by that bar mitzvah, that night in the Baba on Crown Street, where you spoke about the Eberster saying, told Avraham, go out and see it from the outside, step out of the confines of the world, we all give you a bracha that whatever Olam Haza says and whatever medical science says is what your condition is and what your limitations are and what you can't do and you can't do. We are the children of Avraham and we are the, the, the grandchildren of Avraham and Hashem took the first Avraham out. Hashem should tell you also now, say hachutza, 
go out into the sukkah with the name of Adna and Yudke Vavke and all the miracles should happen for you, Lamaila, Minamishur, Lamaila, nothing that we could ever even imagine. This say that you spoke about, this sukkah, which is again sukkah, Gematri Yitzay, should happen for you now also. And uh, we should all be Zeich, of course, to uh, dance together with Yitzi and with Mashiach, Tetkenu, all of us together in the biggest fabrengen that the world ever saw. And let's Shalom just at just joined in. Let's give a bracha to Levi Yitzchok Ben Shaina Basha. He should have it for Shlema. Amen. Have la gezunta freilach and nachas. Siddish a Yiddish a freilach and nachas from your son. He should be at a for Shlema or Kreva. Amen. Amen. I want to wrap it up, of course, with the most important piece. Everything we've been talking about today, the the quintessential perspective of the Rebbe of what is the core of a Yid. All of this is going to become revealed clearly to the whole world when Mashiach comes. So Be'etzim, this entire Fabrengen is a Mashiach to get concept. The whole Rebbe Tainuk, the Montach, is a Leben mit Mashiach. Essentially, what we've been doing this entire hour is Melet mit Mashiach, with a Mashiach take a perspective of Vasis Ayid, Nish Vasis Yenerid, and Echet Vasis Meinidishkeit. That we are Be'etzim, the Bnei Yechid, Eshel HaKadish Baruch Hu. Amen. Thank you, Lazer. Thank you, Hershey. Yitzi, we wish you all a refor shleima o karev, a freilich in yamtif, and a freilich in moyit. Thank you to all participants that participated in this beautiful podcast. Um, the Blazer and the Pershi, two very good friends of Yitzi, have put together a beautiful fabregen around this Dvar uh, Torah that Yitzi wrote up for in honor of Sukkis. We wish you all a freilich in yamtif, and a freilich in moyit, and a gesund in yamtif. And all good things. Thank you very much. This is a